Good morning and welcome to South Point Church. I'm so glad that you chose to be here with us this morning. We want to say hi to those of you online, whether you're on our Facebook or website or on YouTube. I want to say good morning to those of you that actually showed up this morning on behalf of our amazing team and our amazing volunteers and our amazing donors, we just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you actually chose to be with us today. And if this happens to be your first Sunday, whether you're in the room or online, we hope to see you again next Sunday. If you're here, I really encourage you to go to Grow Track to kind of figure out what we're all about. You can actually do it online if you're watching online. And my name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point uh, Church. And so today, uh, we're finishing up a series, but I, I want to talk about something that happened a couple weeks ago. And I don't know if you've ever had something happen to you that reveals something true about life and about humanity. And so this thing that I dealt with, this, this struggle, this kind of problem, I think it reveals something true about all of us, no matter kind of where you're at in life and kind of no matter what you believe. And so it was an ordinary, regular day. It just kind of started off kind of normal. Um, but I ended up hanging out for breakfast with someone who, who matters deeply to me. Um, in the middle of this conversation with someone who matters deeply to me, um, they ended up saying something um, Something so hurtful that I don't think I'll ever forget it all the days of my life. And what I've discovered is, is when people say something hurtful, it's usually because they're hurt. Somebody say amen. Hurt people, hurt people, right? And so I tried not to take it personally, but when somebody that matters to you says something that hurts you so bad that you'll remember it for the rest of your life, it's not a great way to kind of start the morning off, right? And so I went a little bit further into my day, and I ran into something where I heard someone that matters deeply to me. This person, they, they matter to me in my life. They're important, right? And so I discovered that they said something about me to someone else that they hadn't said to me first, you know? And, and can we just agree that, like, if you don't say it to the person, then it's not the right thing to say. You should say it to the person first and let them apologize or figure it out. And so this person said it to someone else, but they didn't say it to me, and they matter deeply to me. And I just go, man, I'm 0 for 2 today. Towards the end of the day, I end up running into someone else that matters deeply to me. And, and as soon as I ran into them, I could tell something was off with them. Um, and they just started kind of like, you know, uh, dumping isn't the right word, but kind of like just sharing their heart. And they were just in a really bad place. It was really tough. A lot was going on. Um, and so I tried to listen, try to be a good listener. Um, I was a little bit sad that I was in a very similar place because <laughs> it had been a day where I wasn't winning. And they didn't ask me a single question about me. And so like, I, I just went, man, I'm over three today. And so literally it was like, I was, I was at home. I was sitting on the couch and I just go, I'm losing today. Today has just been a bad day. And you know what I discovered? I, I discovered something to be true. Um, whenever you get to a place uh, where you just go, I'm not winning, I practice something called halt. It means when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you stop. Because I discovered the hard way. This is, this is free. This isn't even really part of the message. This is free for you, right? I discovered that numbing my pain with things that cause more pains is dumb. So you know what I decided? It was like 7.30 at night. And I told my wife, I said, I'm going to bed. She goes, it's 7.30. I go, I know. I'm going to bed. Because I discovered if I get a good night's sleep and I just shut Crazy Matt down and I get a good night's sleep, have some breakfast, I make less dumb decisions. Can I get an amen? But here's what I discovered. I, I just wasn't winning. And it leads us to a truth that is true about all of us. And it's this right here. It's nearly impossible to win at when we're losing at relationships that, right? I mean, you, you've, like, this isn't rocket scientists. You didn't need to come to church today. You don't, like, you've literally experienced this. I mean, it's nearly impossible to win at life when you're losing at the relationships that matter most, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if you get the best promotion at job if your marriage is failing, doesn't matter how nice of a house you live in or the things that you have. When you have an adult child who you're disconnected with because they pick self-destructive choices that harm them and your family. It doesn't matter how festive the holidays are if your mom or dad can't be there because they have a dysfunction that hurts you and your children. It's empty. It doesn't matter how popular you are when a significant friendship fails. It doesn't matter. And no matter where you're at in life, rich, poor, single, married, young, old, you don't feel like when you're winning at life when the relationships that matter are failing. 
It doesn't matter what you believe, some faith, no faith, different faith. You don't feel like you're winning at life when you're losing at relationships that matter. And it got me thinking, this day, I mean, this was just a couple weeks ago, I was just losing at life, going, man, this just stinks. And I, it made me think, why? Why is this so, like, hard? Why is this so complicated? And then, you know, sometimes, have you ever discovered that answers are so simple that you just don't like the answer? Okay, this is like, this is again, this honesty, right? And, and here's, the, here, here's the admission that we like just need to make it just so honest. Here, here's the admission of why this is so true. Navigating relationships as deeply flawed naturally creates stress. You want to know why there's stress in relationships? It's because we're busted and broken. All of us. So here's what I discovered. If you're cray-cray and I'm cray-cray, if everyone involved in the relationship is defective, then the natural result is dysfunction, and we're just surprised. But that's why there's stress in every relationship is because it's two equally deeply flawed people. But it creates stress. But it leads us to something we need to ask, well, why? Why, why, are, why does it create so much stress? Why does being flawed create so much stress for us? Well, something that we all know. We've all experienced it, but rarely do we ever put words to it. And it's this truth right here that we're really going to tackle today. And it's this right here. Relational stress is caused by the combination of unfair expectations. Got any married people in the house? Just look straight ahead. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Like, just unfair expectations. I mean, when you get married, you have expectations of what it's going to be like, and then real life hits. Got any moms or dads when you had kids? You just thought, this is going to be the great, and then they poop and throw up on you, right? Like, just do we have really fair expectations? And then we have unhealthy boundaries. And what I discovered is, is that the relational stress that we have with each other almost always comes because we have unfair expectations and unhealthy boundaries. And so the question is, is, how do we reduce the stress? How do we win at life by balancing these out-of-balance relationships so that we can have fair expectation and healthy boundaries? Now, we're going to come back to that question because regardless of where we're at and regardless of what we believe, every single one of us to win at life needs the answer to that question. But we're in our last week. We're in week five of a series uh, called Stressed Out. Right, and the whole idea behind this series is that adulting is exhausting and stressful. Can I get an amen from any adults in the room? I mean, come on, man. I mean, you got to work. You got to pay bills. You, somebody's got to go grocery something. Somebody's got to make the food. Somebody's got to do the dishes. Somebody's got to do the laundry. Somebody's got to mow the yard. Somebody's got to take care of the kids. We're supposed to have friends. We're supposed to go to church. Like, just the list makes us exhausted and stressed out, doesn't it? And the whole idea of the series is there's some reasons why that we're a part of that make life stressful. And so over the last five or six weeks, here's the things that we've talked about that stress us out of why we're stressed out. We have unrealistic. We believe if we choose right, somehow it should all work out. And we just know that's not how life works. We live at an unhealthy speed. Speed makes us efficient at the cost of being present. Unprepared for seasons, how we enter and exit the seasons we're in matter deeply. Unquenchable ache that we're trying to solve an eternal problem with temporary things. And then lastly, unbalanced relationships. We're stressed because of all these reasons. But every week, we've been reminded of a truth that sets us free. It's the words of Jesus in the Gospels. It's Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. We're going to put it on screen. Here's what Jesus said. Then Jesus said, come to me. See, that's why we say you are loved. You're, you matter deeply to God. You don't have to have it perfect. You don't have to have it right. You can actually kind of be here and belong before you believe. All. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry your burdens, and I will give you. That we don't have to live hurried and stressed out lives. That Jesus offers us something different. Which led to this idea that, like, come on, if we have a sermon series on stress that stresses you out, that is stupid. <laughs> Nowhere do I want to have a sermon series on stress that makes people leave more stressed. 
And so we've had this saying that we've said every week, and we're going to say it again for the last time week, but this is the truth that we just, that Jesus teaches us that we just need to know that allows us to find the rest that he speaks of, and it's this principle right here. We don't need, there's no adult in the room here that goes, I'd like to add one more thing to my plate. Can I get an amen? We don't need more. We need, and the problem with all of us, myself included, I am the case example of doing the same thing, expecting different results. Whatever your life is, is it actually the results of the things that you do. And oftentimes we practice insanity of going, because I wish it was different, I'm going to still do the same things and hope for different results. We need to get different. We need to do different. And, and here's kind of the good news today is today we're going to kind of stand on its own. Its message will make sense all by itself. But if you miss weeks one through five, no worries. You can just go to our website or you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. And there you can kind of watch on demand. But I, I really encourage you as we talked about some foundational things so that we can find rest in a world that is burdened and weary. But back to our question, right? We, we started with a question, and, and here's the question that we, we need to answer today. If we're going to win at life, we need to be able to answer this question. This is so important. Again, no matter where you're at or what you believe, we need to answer this question. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Is How do we repair out-of-balance relationships? Because it's hard to win at life when you're losing at relationships that matter. So we need to answer this question to be able to win at life. How do I as a flawed person, how do you as a flawed person, how do we as flawed people Repair these out-of-balance relationships that have unfair expectations and unhealthy boundaries. And, and this is why, like, I'm just telling you, I get to this point every message, and then, like, I'm so fired up. Because you know that Jesus dealt with the very thing that you and I deal with. Jesus, literally, everywhere he went, he experienced out-of-balance relationships. Because every person that Jesus encountered was flawed. And what I love about our Heavenly Father is that he left an eyewitness account of how Jesus dealt with this so that we can have fair expectations and healthy boundaries. You know what amazes me about Jesus? Is that he didn't let the fact that we are flawed and busted keep him from pursuing us. Because if we're really honest, when we get hurt, you know what we often do? We often wall ourselves up and say, no one is ever going to hurt me again. And yet Jesus pursued relationships despite the pain and the hurt. Matter of fact, we see this in the eyewitness account of the gospel of Luke. He's about to go to the cross and experience the most horrific eternal pain that he could ever experience in being separated from God the Father, God the Spirit, bear our sin, conquer hell and death, and be raised from the dead. And look what, look what he says. Look what he, Jesus says. He says these words. He says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired. Jesus is saying, listen, before I suffer, before I go through the worst thing that I'm ever going to go through, I want to be with my crew. I want to be with my posse. I want to be with my friends to eat this Passover meal before I suffer. Instead of running from the broken relationships, Jesus actually runs to his crew. And he's having this Passover meal, backyard barbecue, whatever you want to call it. But everyone there is busted and broken. They're flawed. And so there's some unfair expectations and some unhealthy boundaries that Jesus has to deal with. Matter of fact, Jesus gets up before the meal is served. And Jesus is going to do something that shocked everyone there. You have to understand, in first century Jewish custom... People wore sandals, and they often wore these robes that weren't pants. And because it's the Middle East, it's hot, and there aren't paved roads. And if they are, they're just stones. And the problem is it's an agrarian culture, which means there's like sheep and animals and chickens. Everyone thinks running around. So when you walk out on the roads, when you walk on the highways, there are animal stuff. And so you're, you're sweating because it's the Mideast, but yet there's dust and dirt and all the stuff gets on your sandals and all your stuff. So when you went somewhere with someone you had something to eat, you would have the lowest person on the totem pole wash your feet and your legs so that you wouldn't bring all that stuff there. And it was often reserved for slaves and those in the lowest of society. But before this meal, Jesus said, I want to set an example. And so Jesus takes off his outer coat 
and he puts on a towel around his waist and he grabs a bowl and he grabs a washcloth and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. The creator of the universe who spoke everything into existence. Everything in existence is held together because of his power. Got down on his knees and washed poop and dirt and sweat and grime off a hairy, nasty feet. And this is where we see the unfair expectations and unhealthy boundaries and how Jesus responds. In John, we pick it up here. It says this. It says, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? So Peter's not a rocket scientist, apparently. I mean, Jesus got all the gear on. He's probably washed a couple of feet. And then he gets to Peter. And Peter's like, hey, are you going to do that to me? Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. He said, listen, I'm trying to set an example that if you follow me, you are selfless. The church, if we could just grab a hold of that, we could change the world. He said, I'm setting an example. You don't understand what I'm doing, but after I conquer hell and death and prove to you that I am the great I am, You'll understand. Peter's, like, I love Peter because he's me. He just sticks his foot in his mouth all the time. <laughs> Look what Peter says. This is what Peter says to the creator of the universe, Jesus. Look what he says. No. <laughs> no, Jesus. Like, I've seen you raise the dead. I've seen you speak to the seas and calm them. I've seen you raise people who can't walk. I've seen you heal blind eyes. I, I know you're God's son, but no. Don't think so. You shall never wash my feet. And then I, here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus is so just like, I wish I could have been there. Unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. So see, Peter has this expectation that he doesn't need Jesus. He doesn't need Jesus. He doesn't want Jesus. He doesn't need Jesus to do any of those things. He's got it. And you know what I discovered about me? And I wonder if it might be true about you. I often live in the extremes of I don't need anybody or I need you to do everything for me. So he tells Jesus, listen, Jesus, I don't need you to do anything. And then Jesus just looks him straight in the eye. Well, I guess you don't get to hang with me. And then so Peter realized that Jesus is going to set some boundaries. And so Peter does the next best thing. He swings to the other extreme. Look what Jesus and Peter said. Peter said to Jesus, he says, then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Give me a bath, Jesus. <laughs> like, I didn't want anything. Now I want you to do everything. And again, I love Jesus. Jesus. So honest. Jesus answered, those who have a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. So Peter tried to have these unfair expectations of Jesus. No, Jesus, you don't get to have any of my life. Well, Jesus, I need you to do everything for me. And I love that Jesus says, no, I'm going to set some boundaries. No, you, don't, you actually do need me. And no, you don't need me to do everything for you. God's given you some will and some ability. Like, I'm going to set some healthy boundaries there. And it got me thinking, how did Jesus love so well? How was he so selfless, yet was able to hold on to his self-dignity and set healthy boundaries? And the answer is actually found right before Jesus is about to wash their feet in a sentence that I think will change your life because I know it's changed my life. We see it in the hours account of the Gospel of John, John 3, 3. Here, here's what it says. It says, Jesus, sometimes we just need to know and our knower. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. What allowed Jesus to be selfless yet have self-dignity. He knew where he had come from, and he knew where he was going. Y'all missed it. Because when you know where you've come from, and you know where you're going, you are free to be who God made you to be. You see, Jesus was free to be exactly who he was, God's son, because he knew that he was there in the beginning before anything. He knew that the universe was held together by his very power, and he knew despite the fact that he was going to die a criminal's death and he was going to be buried, that he would conquer hell and death, and he would sit at the right hand of the Father. He knew where he was going. 
And I want you to know whether you're online or in the room, if you know where you've come from and you know where you're going, you are free to be a you and you will set the world on fire. So here, here, here's what Jesus did. And I'm going to put on the screen. Here's what Jesus both modeled and Jesus taught. And it's this right here. Be selfless. Because what's wrong with the world is that we're selfish. Somebody say amen. What's wrong is that everybody wants what they want. And when we live in a world and community, that creates destruction and brokenness. Jesus teaches us to be selfless without abandoning our self-dignity. You know, it's so funny I know this has been true of me, and I just, I just wonder if it's true of other Christians. We realize how busted and broken we are, and so we allow people to walk on us. We allow people to use us, and we think it's somehow God's love that we're loving people than not setting healthy boundaries. But other times we go, oh, we're children of God, and I get a car, and you get a car, and we all get a car. And we believe our whole life is about God blessing us, and we become selfish. And so the real question is, is where do we live where we can be selfless without abandoning self-dignity? And this truth is so true that the Apostle Paul, this guy who used to kill Christians, encountered a risen Jesus. And he's writing a group of Jesus followers just like us. They were young. They were old. They were rich. They were poor. They were ethnically diverse, right? And he's writing to them. And here's what he writes to them. This, this truth is so important. He writes it to them in the church of Philippi. Here's what he writes in a letter called Philippians. Each of you should be concerned not only about your... So he's saying, listen, you should be concerned about your own interests, but not only your own interests, but about the interests of others as you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. That yes, we're absolutely supposed to be responsible people for ourselves, but we should also be concerned for others. Did you know that we can be selfless without abandoning our self-God-given dignity? The real question is, is how do we do that? Because it's stupid hard. Can I get an amen? And I wish I could tell you that I've got it down, but I don't. But I will tell you there's a truth that I've discovered that will set you free and will set me free to have fair expectations and healthy boundaries. And it's this truth that the scriptures and that Jesus are teaching us. And it's this right here. Our I Come on, church. Because can we just be honest here? I'm going to offend everyone. This is what we call a buckle moment. Ping, like when you're on a roller coaster ride and they don't want to throw you out and you get hurt. I'm probably going to hurt you right now. So just I'm an equal opportunity offender. Often we wrap our identity in our nationality. Well, I'm an American. Well, if you're a Jesus follower, you're a Jesus follower first. Or we wrap our identity in our politics. I'm this or I'm that. Well, if you're a Jesus follower, Jesus comes first, not your political party. Our culture tells us our identity should be based on our bank account or our sexual orientation or whatever it is that we want. But if you're a Jesus follower, our identity is a Jesus follower first. Our identity in Christ is the foundation for our, our relational expectation boundaries. Our identity, where have we come from and where are we going? We are broken and we are beloved. If you could, if I can grab, if we can grab a hold of this, we will have healthy boundaries and we will have fair expectations. Because when we realize that there aren't any perfect people, that there we are all equal at the foot of the cross, that none of us is better than anyone else out there, that if we had been born them in their circumstances, we'd be them. But by the grace of God, go I. That each of us is equally broken. We are not saved because we came to church or we were born in America because we did good deeds. We are loved and saved because of what Jesus did on the cross. That we are all equally broken and busted. And you know what that allows us to do? It allows us to have empathy. It allows us to have compassion. It allows us to have grace to others who hurt us because we realize we're just as broken. You give me grace today because you're going to need it tomorrow. We are all broken, and you are a beloved daughter or son of the Most High, that there is nothing that you can do to undo God's love, that on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, that God can't love you, that there is no height or depth, no evil, nothing can separate us from the love of God found in the one name, Jesus, that you are beloved. And what this does is when we're broken, it allows us to have fair expectations that other broken people, nobody's going to bat a thousand. 
Y'all, y'all miss that. Because then you would say amen. Because then you won't expect that from others, and then others won't expect it from you because we're all. But we're also. So that means we should respect and be selfless and love each other, but also people should give us dignity because we realize broken people hurt other people, and hurting others isn't the thing that Jesus wants to do. So we need to set healthy boundaries. So when we're broken and beloved, it allows us to set fair expectations and fair boundaries. Can I get an amen? When you know where you're coming from and when you know where you're going, you are free. Because you're not defined by others or your failures. You're defined by the one who conquered hell and death. You can clap. It's about to get ugly. Because there's a couple of truths we just got to close with that are, that are really true that I, I think are going to offend everyone here. Because uh, I think we're going to tackle some myths that, we, that we've all bought into. And so um, just, just buckle up. You guys still like me when we're done, please. So here's three truths we need to do to be able to walk out being broken and beloved. And, and here are the three truths that if we're going to practically live it out. And here's the first one. No one... Can you bleed us? Because we're often told the fairy tale that if we find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, we'll be complete. Aww. <laughs> Except that you're broken and they're broken. And that ain't going to work. Now, I want to tell you something. This is something that I've struggled with more than I care to admit publicly. As someone who was abandoned and abused as a child, physically, sexually, emotionally, and relationally, I chased trying to get the right girl that would complete me. And then when I caught the homecoming queen, I realized that no person can complete you. I love my adopted dad who is my hero. If I could just get him to see how great of a person I am, maybe I'll be complete. And as great as my dad is, he's flawed. I tried to be the best parent that I possibly could, but I'm not a perfect parent. And there's no such thing as perfect kids. And if we're really honest, I just want to, if I can just be so honest, I see so many people who are asking their spouse, their parents, and I'm sorry, for some of you, it's your kids. Our job is to be a parent, not their friend. Our kid cannot complete us. Our parents cannot complete us. And our spouse cannot complete us. You want to know why they can't do that? It's because you were made to be loved perfectly. And because we're imperfect, no one can love you perfectly. So we're asking the imperfect to do the perfect, which can never happen. There's only one perfect person. His name is Jesus. The only one that we can complete us is our Heavenly Father. True story. My wife and I, we have one of those little, what do you call them, like those outside tables on our deck, you know, where you sit, and it has like a little umbrella, and we like to go out during the summertime. I, I grill burgers, and we sit out there, and we play 80s dance music. <laughs> All right, so that's just our little jam, right? And so I put some like little tea lights, and the tea lights that were up were like a couple years old, so I replaced them, right, with some new tea lights. But these were different tea lights, and they took different batteries. And anybody got one of those junk drawers where you, you put everything, but then you can actually never find anything in the junk drawer? Like... Okay, great. So I went to the junk drawer looking for batteries. And what I discovered is, is this, this tea light set had a battery set that required batteries that I had. I had some triple A's. I had some A's. I had, uh, you know, uh, those D ones that you lick when you're a little kid that, like, electrocuted your tongue. Am I the only one that did that? Nine volt, right? Yeah. And here's what I discovered. It didn't matter if I had those batteries, the little battery case for this tea light thing required double A batteries because that's what it was made for. You were made for your heavenly father and there is no spouse, no child, and no parent that will complete you, only your heavenly father. This one's going to freak all y'all out. I just want you to know this. Healthy relationships don't just happen. Because we buy into the myth and the fairy tale. If I find the right person, then it should just naturally work. If it's love, should it just work all by itself? No, you're cray-cray and they're cray-cray. I don't know why you expect some magical thing to fix. You, you're busted, they're busted. It's going to be dysfunctional. You should just be used to it. Healthy relationships don't just did you know that healthy friendships, healthy relationships with your kids, healthy relationships with your spouse, they don't just happen it's like farming. 
See, farming requires that you have intentionality and that you invest to get something on the end. Many of us don't invest and aren't intentional and are surprised when we have no crop of good relationship. I, I'm telling you, I was going to offend everybody today. My wife, about a decade ago, she goes, love. I asked her what she wanted for her birthday. She said, I want a garden. I said, a garden? She said, yes, love, will you build me a garden? Now, when you're a husband, sometimes you just say yes and you don't say things. Now, the reason I can say this is because my wife isn't here today. <laughs> my wife has a brown thumb. She's killed every living thing that we've ever had. And she said she wanted a garden. And instead of me reminding her that she killed every living thing that's come in her home, I just said, yes, dear. So I went out there and I tore up some shrubs. I mean, I spent a couple of days, went to the, you know, the, the lumber store, got lumber, put it all out there. And I was like, man, she was like, thank you. She hugged me. She was so excited. Guess how many things that she's planted in our garden in the last decade? A zero. <laughs> and she keeps calling it our garden. Now we're all laughing, but that's how many of us handle our relationships. We invest and aren't intentional, but expect something to grow. And I just want you to know, I tried to teach my daughters this when they're young. To have a friend, you need to be a friend. Healthy relationships don't just happen. They require intentionality and investment. And here's the third one, and this, this is the hard one. Seek God's approval. <laughs> man, man, I'm just going to tell on myself today. So bad. The other day I was praying, like I was going through my prayer lists, and one of, my, and one of the things on my prayer list is, God, help me to like be like you, to not want things from other people, to not want their, you know, their talent, their abilities, their money, their houses, car. like God, help me not be envious or jealous, right? And I feel like most of the time I'm really good at that. So I don't know if you've ever been praying and then you're, you're like praying, but you're really bragging to God. <laughs> Am I the only one that does that? That's great. And I'm your pastor. Anyway, let's pray and brag to God. Look at me. I, I'm, not, I'm not envious. I'm not jealous. Like, I just, I don't want people's things. I'm for my people. And God said, you sure do covet people's approval. I wish you wanted my approval as bad as you want everyone to like you. <laughs> so, true story. I was having a budget conversation. Budget conversations are the best. <laughs> Anyway, I was having a budget conversation with my family. And if you know anything about me because of how I grew up, I just want my family to love me. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good dad. You know, I want to be a good family member. And so we're having a budget meeting. And, and I've typically always spoiled my family because I just want them to know that I love them. I want them to think well of me. And so anyway, we're having a budget meeting. And somebody in our family wanted to do something that wasn't wrong or dumb. It's just not the right time and the right expense and the, kind of the right thing. And so in this moment, I was tempted to say, you just do it. Like, I just love you. You just do whatever you want to do. But it wasn't what was best for the family. And so in that moment, I chose to do what was right, not what made them happy. And I think often when we set healthy boundaries, it's about am I honoring God first? Am I chasing what's right, or am I chasing how I'll look to others? And I was able to say that because here's what I've discovered. And I'm like, I'm just learning this. I mean, which is a little bit sad considering my age. But when you know where you've come from, and when you know where you're going, when you know that you are beloved regardless, and when you realize that you are broken, but you are headed to the right place, that you can have fair expectations and healthy boundaries. So what do we do? I mean, it's, it's really just simple. And here's the simple thing we need to do to be able to win at our relationships that matter despite our dysfunction is allow our identity in Christ. Allow our identity in Christ to set fair expectations of others, of ourselves, and to set healthy boundaries. Because when we allow ourselves or others to create hurt in their life and our lives, that's not love. That's called enabling. Our identity in Christ reminds us that we're broken, yet we're beloved. We can be selfless and hold God's self-dignity. 
So hey, I just have a, a quick challenge. Here's a quick challenge. My guess is that I've gone through this kind of message today about out of balance relationship where there's unfair expectations and unhealthy boundaries that you immediately thought, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm going to go there, that you immediately thought of an unhealthy boundary that you probably have need to set right. Or my guess is that you probably had some unfair expectations of people that you go, oh, if they're flawed, if they're broken like me, then maybe I shouldn't have that expectation that they'll bat a thousand. And so the simple challenge is, is there a relationship where you have unfair expectations and unhealthy boundaries? To just think about it this week and maybe allow your identity in Christ to set those expectations and those boundaries. It's funny, I was trying to think about how to close this message and I was reminded of a conversation I had, you know, I don't know if you know, but almost 20 years ago, South Potomac Church, about 45 minutes away up in La Plata, actually planted South Point Church and I was a church planner, right? And the, the pastor at that church then, he's now retired, his name was Brent Books. And, and on a regular basis, he and I would get together, and he was kind of like a coach and a mentor. He'd ask me how things are going, ask me about my spiritual life, give me wisdom, you know, kind of mentoring me, right? And I, I don't know if you noticed, but I like to talk. And so we were having lunch, and, and I had this bad habit of, like, interrupting. Like, he would say something, and I'd be like, yeah, but what about me? And I would talk about me, because I'm my own favorite subject. Sound familiar? <laughs> And I had interrupted him and I was talking and all of a sudden it was so awesome. He put his hand up and he had like this grin. He just went, he just kind of smiled. He's a little bit of an older guy, you know, and he's kind of smiled like that grandfatherly smile. And he went like this. And I talked for a few more seconds, but I realized at the end of the I said, what, what, what? He goes, um, I need to understand how this is going to work. What, what's going to happen is, is I'm going to talk for a little bit and you're going to actually listen. And he says, then you're going to talk and then I'm going to actually listen. Okay, that, that's how it's going to work. Are we good? I went, yes, sir. And then, then I stopped talking and let him talk. And what I loved about it wasn't just the words that he said, but how he said it. That he understood that I was broken, but he knew that it was worth setting healthy boundaries. And so I wonder as we go through this life and, and as we think about our relationships and we admit that we're broken and we're beloved... What are fair expectations? And what are healthy boundaries? Because it's impossible to win at life when we're losing at relationships that matter. Hey, let me pray. Hey, God, thank you. Thank you that we're not going to stay where we were, which was broken and busted and flawed and failed. But God, we do know where we're going, that there's an inheritance and an eternity as beloved daughters and sons of the Most High because of what Jesus did on the cross. You are faithful and good, God. And we are not defined by the labels that we put on ourselves or the labels that others put on us. Instead, we are defined by the empty tomb that there's a God who showed up and who lived and died and was crucified and buried and rose on the third day. That we are the beloved daughters and sons of the Most High. And our value comes from how much you love us. And our identity in you sets how we relate to others so that we can find rest and peace in you. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, and all who agreed said, amen. amen.